So let's start this podcast on an interesting note. So about four years back, I was looking to take my Go skills to the next level. And uh, I was actually looking for a good open source project, uh, which is written in Go. And one quick search took me to CockroachDB and Pebble. So although I was looking to hone my programming skills and making my Go skills, basically taking my Go skills to the next level, I actually spent a lot more time reading to the CockroachDB's engineering blogs to understand what is what it is really doing under the hood. And uh, this got me introduced to the amazing world of distributed SQL. And then I kind of moved my career trajectory in that direction as well. So, and today I'm really excited to host the co-founder and the chief architect of Cockroach TV, Ben Darnell. Uh, and when I posted about this podcast on my social handles, I legit got some few people calling out him to be a genius. And I do not disagree. Uh, by going through his profile, we can surely say uh, he's the best programmer out there. And uh, because one more reason being that building a distributed SQL database from scratch is no joke. So first of all, thank you so much, Ben, for doing this. It means a ton. I have a ton of questions for you. But before we begin discussing Cockroach, let me start with something which is much closer to your heart. Why do you like database so much? Um, I thought I uh, fell into databases accidentally. Um, I, uh, I I would not have uh, would not have considered myself a, a database person before. But you can't build an application without a database. It's just a, a necessary part of any uh, of any system you may want to you may want to build. And so um, you know I got into uh, got into uh, building CockroachDB uh, along with my co-founders because um, we. Uh, had uh, spent the, a good portion of our careers at at Google working with uh, with Bigtable and uh, and GFS and Colossus and uh, and uh, th things like this. And uh, once we got uh, out into the outside world and were faced with the challenge of choosing a database for our own startup, uh, we were really dissatisfied with the uh, with the status quo of uh, which was uh, pretty much sh uh, manually sharded MySQL. Um, and uh, you, you know, I'd worked with that at other companies, uh, Facebook, Dropbox, and uh, and elsewhere. And uh, you, you know, really seen that that was really painful to work with at scale. And so we felt like we needed to, uh, you know, we could do a better job, and that we needed to do a better job to build the uh, build the database that the modern world needs. Oh, so basically, that's what uh, basically got you basically building CockroachDB in the first place. So, uh, but in general, there, there, there would be a pivotal moment in your life that like, hey, this is what I love doing, let's say 24-7. Uh, what was that? What was it? Basically, was it working with GFS or basically Colossus and whatnot? That got you really excited about databases or was it its intricate difficulty when it comes to doing it in a distributed fashion? Like, what was that part? Yeah, I think that... Um... When you look at uh, when you look at a database, it's really all of computer science in one product. You've got uh, you've got scheduling like a like an operating system. You've got uh, you know pr uh, whole programming language uh, to to uh, interpret or uh, or compile or process somehow. Um, you've got uh, you know core algorithmic data structure work uh, dealing with uh, fault tolerance on disk, um, learning about how the how the kernel manages uh, manages writing to disk and flushing. Uh, Flushing things atomically and and things like that. So it's uh, you know within the one problem of databases, you kind of have all of uh, all the different parts of of computer science coming together. I mean they're one of the uh, along with probably operating systems um, and uh, and web browsers. They're kind of uh, what one of those all encompassing uh, projects that within them you can find all kinds of variety. Very interesting. Like the way you put it, as uh, all the all the core concepts of computer science in one place. And to be honest, that's what makes me also excited about databases because right from file formats to a layer of interaction to layer of distributed. In case in case in case you are going on that route, plus OS level optimizations that we need to do. Like almost like uh, when I was trying to attempt to build a database of mine, I spent more time reading through the man pages than anything else because the <laughs> magic happens at the at the level of basically when you do a lot of system calls like for example doing a uh, zero copy reads and writes like the, 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 those are the kind of things that basically got me also excited into this talk right? so what was that uh like i know everybody like if you ask a lot of programmers out there most of them would say hey i want to build either a programming language of my own or a database of my own okay? and what was the motivation for you to build yet another database? Like, what was that gap that you saw, which made you do like, hey, let's build our own database? 
Yeah, so there were uh, th there were a few things. Um, you know, we came up with the idea of uh, of CockroachDB uh, while uh, my co-founders and I were actually building a uh, mobile photo sharing app called Viewfinder, um, which you you haven't heard of. Uh, basically, nobody used it. Um, but uh, you, you know, even though we were at uh, at day one with no uh, with no users, we knew that if this was going to be successful, it was going to be uh, it was going to be really huge. Um, you, you know, we didn't want to set ourselves up. Uh, with uh, you know going with a simple uh, Postgres or MySQL solution that we were then going to have to convert into a complicated sharding uh, setup later on, and uh, you, you know we wanted to be able to build uh, build our application correctly from the from the beginning and uh, and have it be able to uh, to grow. But there was no database platform out there that uh, that really uh, met those uh, met those needs. Um, we had worked with uh, worked extensively with uh, non-SQL databases earlier in our career. Um, in my case, using uh, Bigtable as a as a part of the, the Google Reader backend. And uh, in every time that we found ourselves working with uh, with non-SQL databases, we would end up uh, kind of uh, with a hacky re-implementation of uh, of significant SQL functionality on top of the uh, on top of the non-SQL database. And so that's really where the idea was that we, we wanted the database to do the database's job of ensuring uh, transactional consistency and uh, flexible indexing and uh, and all of these uh, all of these things that you take for granted with uh, with SQL. Um, and so we wanted to give you all those features that come with SQL while giving you the easy and transparent scalability that uh, that's associated with uh, with non SQL databases. And we knew from our time at Google that this was possible. Uh, Spanner kind of gave us the existence proof of that. And so we started with that as our, uh, that as our initial inspiration. And then we decided, uh, we, we looked at the problem and you know, figured out what it, uh, what it would take to bring that to, the, uh, to the, the rest of the world. So when you spoke about Viewfinder, was it your own startup? Uh, yes, it was, it was actually uh, my co-founders, uh, Spencer and Peter, uh, they started the company first and then I, I joined them a little bit later. This, this visit kind of looks like a problem of over-engineering. Like you folks, <laughs> you folks ventured out instead of building the product, let's build Sorry, the, let's, basically, let's, let's basically build our own database. So pretty interesting. <laughs> uh, so get that, uh, obviously the initial days would be, uh, quite interesting, but before that, like how big is your team right now? Like now that you have a massive set of offerings, uh, as a cloud distributed SQL environment. Uh, how how big is your like how big is your team and how big is the scale that 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 basically you folks handle? Yeah, so we have um, we have a I think we have almost uh, almost four hundred uh, employees at the uh, at the company. Um, we have uh, really uh, really uh, a huge uh, user user base. Um, I'm not uh, not not allowed to name uh, name a lot of our biggest customers, but uh, th there are a lot of names that you know. We have uh, two of the five largest banks in the world, uh, two of the five largest automakers, uh, companies like Netflix, Comcast, uh, Bose. A lot of uh, a lot of big customers out there using uh, CockroachDB for uh, for, for very uh, very interesting things and at uh, at very significant levels of scale. Like basically, can you just quote some numbers, like not some basically specific to a customer, but in general, uh, with respect to the queries per second you handle or the or the number of latencies? Um, it's uh, unfortunately one of the one of the difficult things about SQL is that it's really mm -hmm. hard to generalize because there's so mm -hmm. much uh, so much variation in what one query can uh, can do, and mm -hmm. so it's. Uh, it's it's really uh, really tough to, uh, to to give a a, a general answer there. Uh, so okay, now that we are talking about like you spoke about banks, uh, like two of the most prominent banks are uh, your customers. Now banks typically strong consistency, heart and soul for the bank. Right? Now in this case, it is always a common thing that hey, why can't I just use the age old uh, basically age old thing which is really battle tested like a MySQL cluster or or a Postgres thing, and I just shard it if I just want to scale it out horizontally. Uh, what what is like the like the unification that you folks are doing with respect to the distributed SQL? Uh, why can't I just simply shard a MySQL cluster and use it? Like what's what's like what is a limitation of that? Well, for one thing, sharding is not simple. Um, it really multiplies your operational costs as you're managing a bunch of more or less independent databases, and you have to coordinate things like schema changes across all of them. So, it uh, so so the first problem with sharding is is just 
how, uh, how, how difficult it is to do and to, uh, and to maintain it over time. Um, the second difficulty is that you make a lot of compromises in, uh, in, in the transactional support of the, of the database when you do this. Um, you have, uh, you, you, you have, uh, little, if any, ability to make consistent changes across shards. Um, you can't have, uh, you can't have, uh, indexes spanning shards. You may have to fan out your queries to, uh, to all the shards to find where your, uh, where your data is. Um, and in general, it's just something that's, uh, you know, it's something that's bolted on after the fact, um, as opposed to being integrated into the database where the database itself can, uh, can give you full transactional support, be aware of, uh, of data locality and, uh, and data proximity, uh, as it's, uh, as it's planning query execution and, and things like that. So this is primarily a very nice layer because at the end, someone needs to do the dirty job, right? Like either, either you, either you shard and you do the dirty job around doing the schema changes across all the shards and whatnot, or otherwise mm -hmm. let your, let the, let the actual database do it. So, uh, yes. that's, that I see as a strong suit there, but on, on, uh, like in case of a distributed SQL, I see it as the storage needs to be distributed along with this, the execution needs to be distributed. Right? So storage distribution, like when your data is at rest, it's pretty easy to, uh, split it and basically split it across multiple nodes and whatnot. But things become really interesting. The point also you brought up around when it comes to distributed execution, where you might need to create, let's say a global secondary index or a local secondary index on the data for the particular shard mm -hmm. or, or a global one across shards. Right now with this kind of thing, uh, could you like talk about some interesting challenges that you saw when you were conceptualizing? Because the beautiful part of this is you are still offering SQL as an interface while well, beneath that scenes every single thing around distributed storage and distributed execution is actually taken care of. So, uh, what, what were the key challenges when it came to distributed execution of queries across multiple, uh, nodes, you know, while guaranteeing strong consistency? Uh, yeah. So first of all, let me say that I, I, I like this framing about talking about, uh, distributed, uh, storage and distributed execution, um, because there's actually a lot of databases out there now that, uh, that are offering distributed storage, but, uh, but, there's not not so many offering uh, truly distributed execution, um, and so this is uh, this is something that uh, that sets us apart, and uh, and so we've had to build out a system. Um, this is uh, th this is why we took on the task of building our own uh, query optimizer from scratch, um, so that it can be aware of uh, of both the uh, the logical organization of data and indexes on disk, and also the physical uh, location of data across the across the cluster. Um, and so we actually, um, as a part of our query planning process, um, you can use the uh, use the explain uh, command in the CockroachDB shell to see uh, to see some examples of this. You know, we put together a, a directed graph of the uh, of the query execution plan, and then we uh, we look into the uh, look into the graph, see where um, wh where are the best places to uh, to kind of cut uh, cut the execution chain um, and distribute it across different nodes. And so, um, for example, if you do a uh, if you do a query with a group by and a sum function, um, for example, then maybe every node in the cluster is going to run uh, the first part of processing that query. It's going to run through the uh, run through the, the data that it has locally, and it's going to compute uh, partial sums of uh, of all of the outputs, and then it's going to send those partial sums up to some uh, some chosen coordinator node that can uh, that can collect all the all the partial sums and give you the totals at the end. And so we're, we, uh, we 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 thought how to uh, how to do these kinds of aggregations to um, whereas in, in a traditional database this would be a single uh, a single node in the plan graph in CockroachDB it's something that can be uh, that can be split up and spread across uh, across nodes to, so that we can do uh, to minimize the amount of data that is uh, is transferred across the network and maximize the uh, way that we're able to parallelize across the across the fleet of compute resources. So one interesting like the one interesting thing that I thought of while, while, while you were explaining this was about how this is very similar to how an OLAP system would work, okay. where, where you have an execution plan, which gets distributed across multiple nodes. They each do that person kind of like map reduce, but obviously it's not for analytics purposes, but doing it synchronously mm -hmm. while offering strong consistency. And I now I see the magic sauce that basically makes you folks special, right? When 
uh one thing around strong consistency i was while while i was exploring uh while i was exploring cockroach i found i read one really interesting sentence in basically one of your blogs it was said uh, it said that uh sql 1992 standard states that serializable should be the default transaction isolation level i know you write a, you the two things you write about one is isolation level and one is distributed consensus <laughs> i saw i i <laughs> i read all of your blog posts right so i i mm-hmm. i wanted to touch upon this that uh, sql 1992 standard says that serializable isolation level should be the one which is offered out of the box by databases but now we see uh, people of like the the like in case of mysql it is basically repeatability right but the thing is like people are going for a weaker isolation level uh, assuming that it would give you better performance and discarding and and making serializable which was which is supposed to be giving you very strong consistency but making it as kind of an anomaly that hey only if you need strict then only you do this right but cockroach goes with serializable out of the box okay and it's a very common misconception that serializable isolation level turns out to be really slow and it would just reduce the throughput of a system so first what made you choose serializable like what made you go with serializable isolation level as a default choice and then uh why like what's the secret sauce behind you preferring that so much over other isolation yeah so um you know the first question is pretty easy um you, you know why did we make uh, why did we make serializable the default um we believe that we should always uh prioritize uh doing things uh correctly and then um and then when uh what when and if it turns out to be too slow we can look at uh look at what's going on and decide where we need to start uh where we need to start cutting corners um in order to uh in order to provide uh better uh, better performance uh, and what we've seen as we implemented uh serializability um in cockroach db um is that uh you, you know it's not uh it, it reducing isolation is not the uh is not the magic solution to uh to improving performance that uh, that people often think it is um we uh we we looked at uh, at serializability in uh, in comparison to uh to, to uh repeatable read and we found that we couldn't make a we we couldn't find a way to implement uh, repeatable read or snapshot isolation in a way that was substantially faster than um that than serializability in in a distributed environment uh which i think is the key um a distributed environment changes um ch- changes the shape of a lot of uh, a lot of the performance considerations and so um in uh, in monolithic databases uh, it may be possible to get a bigger uh, a bigger difference between uh read committed and uh, and serializable in performance um but we find that for us in a distributed environment that it doesn't make a uh, it doesn't make as big of a difference for performance as uh, as you might think it's such an excellent point because we always treat it as a very crude generalized statement that uh, a certain isolation level is better than other in some cases but and we we basically forget about this assumption that we are always like we almost always thought about it being a single node right mm-hmm. where you might see the performance but when it comes distributed because of all the network calls which is involved mm-hmm. and the amount of processing and almost like basically multiple synchronous write across multiple shards that you might want to do things change right that mm-hmm. is such an interesting insight over there yeah pretty solid and uh, but do you see this as like like obviously when you go for a stricter consistency like sorry a stricter isolation level it should affect throughput right? so given that you still have a lot of cust- like you do have a lot of customers and this cockroach db is growing it is very evident that uh, you are still not compromising on throughput much can i say that that without compromising on throughput much you are able to give strong serializable isolation level uh yes definitely i think uh we see uh we see with our uh read committed and serializable isolation levels that uh actually the throughput is uh is fairly similar uh between them um we even have some some benchmarks that show serializable being faster than read committed um but uh you, you know where the where there's a difference is in terms of uh, of latency and especially consistency of latency so um in general re- uh, the latency of uh, of a read committed transaction 
tends to be uh, more consistent than uh, than in a serializable transaction because in a serializable transaction um, for some small fraction of uh, of transactions that experience uh, conflicts those have to uh, restart and try over uh, strip uh, re retry and, and start over and that, uh, that that means that some small fraction of your uh, of your transactions will take uh, twice as long as they otherwise would and so that uh, that, that variance is uh, is a bigger concern than the uh, than the throughput. This is this is like this. These are the kind of insights which are missing. Like when I, I I used to have a lot of questions, but now by like in most cases, even I did not realize that I had that bias. That uh, I always thought that a certain isolation level is better than other, and you would always go for serializable when you needed the most and could affect your throughput and all. But just this, but the way you spoke about this and my assumption, like that, that, that basically fundamental assumption that I made. And when I take that out, a lot of things start to make sense that uh, it's okay to like, although you're not affecting throughput much, given the nature of transactions you would be doing, multiple synchronous rights and whatnot. It's pretty interesting. I'm learning so much. Thanks. Thanks for that. Okay, one interesting thing, like I, as I started with uh, the introduction, uh, two projects I stumbled upon, one was Pebble, one was Cockroach. I started with Pebble. I basically, I kind of love embedded databases more uh, because of uh, the crude insights that they operate on with respect to the storage layout and whatnot. So I was more inclined towards, I wanted to know what, like the, basically rocks DB existed. I saw mm -hmm. Pebble came up as a small rock. Yeah. I, I I wanted to know what basically what's the story behind writing your own embedded DB like Pebble to power cockroach. Like what was the thought process? Because you started with building a product, but then you ventured mm -hmm. out into building a database. Then you also reimagined the core storage layer of it. So there has to be a very strong motive behind a potential gap that you folks were seeing. Uh, basically, what's the story behind Pebble? Sure. So we actually used RocksDB in Cockroach for the first uh, the first several years, um, and uh, it, it was mostly working uh, working very well for us. Uh, but there was a lot of friction with it. Um, it was written in C++ instead of Go, so a lot of our engineers didn't know how to work with it very well. Um, it uh, it was a big contributor to our build times, um, and uh, and things like that. But the bigger reason was that uh, RocksDB is a uh, is a very big project. It's uh, it was started by uh, by Facebook, uh, but has been uh, has been fairly community driven. They've accepted a lot of uh, a lot of pull requests, new features contributed by the community. And what we were finding was that these uh, these features were um, were fairly inconsistent in quality, and uh, and a lot of times didn't interact very well together. And so we would find a uh, Find a feature that they uh, that they had um, for doing uh, range deletions, for example, and uh, and that was performing very poorly for us. And uh, it was because we were using um, it was some combination of configuration options that just weren't uh, weren't working very well together. And um, and the RocksDB team had never run that particular uh, combination of configurations before, and so we were uh, we were constantly tripping over these uh, th these things that just didn't work as well as. Uh, as well as they could, and then making changes to fix things was uh, was more complicated than it needed to be, and so eventually we decided that uh, you know we're we're a database. This is uh, this is a fundamental part of uh, of a database is the is the storage layer that writes to disk, and we should uh, we should be uh, in control of our own uh, of our own destiny there and run uh, and uh, and have a uh, have a storage layer that is uh, that is very well tuned for for our needs and doesn't need to. Necessarily fit any uh, any outside uh, any outside community needs. So, how long did it take you to build Pebble? Like you and your team to build Pebble? Um, I can't remember. I was no, I was not involved in the uh, in the Pebble mm. project. That was uh, mainly my uh, my co-founder Peter uh, put mm. the st started that off. Um, and uh, but it, it was uh, getting it uh, getting it actually deployed was a. Uh, a very long process um, spanning uh, spanning a couple of years uh, because we wanted to roll out with uh, support for uh, RocksDB and Pebble uh, in parallel and uh, and to, you know just give you a switch that you could flip to uh, to turn it on and off and so it uh, it went over uh, over the course of uh, of several uh, several years before we uh, were able to finally remove uh, RocksDB from the code base. 
that is always a pain that is always a pain like without without mm-hmm. like it's it's not about building but but when you try to actually roll it out and basically giving your customers an able to switch to the new one the newer customers get tabled and then you slowly ask them to migrate plus some friction there that comes in yeah. why should we and what not I've, i've been i've been i've been part of a couple of projects where you had to do something similar and I, i'm like basically building it took much lesser time but yeah. basically getting it adopted and getting it fully rolled out was was a much 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 longer process yeah so one thing uh, like rocks tv uh, is an is a is basically very famously lsm based implementation so which is a key value store right now which means like with respect to cockroach tv also the underlying storage becomes key value because people is also key value right? you have mm-hmm. very beautifully built a sql layer on top of it while i was going through few of the internal details of it on how you store uh, the data on the disk and all it is it fascinated me so much that how come the underlying layer which is key value stored and uh, uh, i'm and uh, uh, when i went to the detail and again please correct me if i'm wrong the value like the value is not the entire row but the value is the single atomic value let's say if my table has five columns then you create five entries in the key value store right uh, um, or is it a one row So that that that's that's uh, obsolete. That's how we did it uh, in the very earliest mm. versions. Um, mm. But now the key value entry is uh, is a column family, which is by default the entire row. I was actually going to ask this that that if you actually consider doing it with respect to column family or not. Okay, so yeah. that got answered. Uh, that's super. So what like it is really interesting on how you folks build a SQL layer on mm. top of this entire key value store. i could draw parallels through how basically myrox uh, actually does it it's rocks db mm-hmm. based storage engine for mysql which which uh, which, which again basically facebook uh, built it really beautifully so i could draw parallels to it uh, mm-hmm. what is like how did you like what were the key challenges when basically when it came to mm-hmm. having a sql layer built on top of a data which is laid out in a key value format uh, how how do you tackle this problem um Yeah. So first of all, let me say that it's uh, it's not only my rocks, but uh, but regular MySQL with NoDB is uh, is based on a very similar architecture. NoDB is a key value store. Yeah. Uh, even SQLite is uh, is uh, that uses a similar kind of uh, kind of architecture. So um, what we do with the key value store is we take uh, in the key value store uh, the values, as you said, are the uh, are all of the values in the in the column family. And then on the key that is uh, an encoded version of uh, of the index columns, so the primary key or whatever secondary key this is in the index. And um, so what we had to do is uh, uh, so we're not only we're not only a key value store. It's important to note that this is uh, an an ordered key value ordered store. Ordered key value store. So yeah, we can sorry. go through uh, go through consecutive uh, consecutive values in order. We can do uh, th- things like seeking for the uh, seeking for the nearest uh, the nearest value to a to a given key, uh, which is important for processing different kinds of queries. And so we need to come up with a way to encode any SQL data type as a uh, as a key that is going to be ordered in the same way as the SQL data type. And so for some For some data types like strings or uh, or fixed size integers, that's uh, that's straightforward. Um, you, you know, you can just take uh, take an integer and write it as a, a big Indian byte sequence, and uh, and then that sorts in the right uh, in the right way. Um, for other other kinds of data, um, especially floating point numbers or arbitrary precision decimals, um, then it gets a little tricky. Um, fortunately, it's a it's a well studied problem. We didn't have to invent a new solution. There were uh, things out there. Um, and so we just have ways of uh, of encoding any indexable SQL data type um, in a uh, in an ordered uh, ordered fashion. Yes. So with respect to this uh, SQL layer, like my my actually my my uh, follow up question with what this is, uh, who decides the column family? Like when I actually create a table in Cockroach DB, do I have to specify a column family like how we do it with this Cassandra, or is it implicitly derived uh, by the database? So by default, um, yeah, every table has one column family that contains all of its columns. Hmm. So uh, column fa- so so this is this is where some of our oldest documentation and blog posts gets confusing because hmm. originally it was uh, it was every column got its own column family and then uh, column families were introduced as a way to merge columns together. Now we've decided to default to one uh, to one family per 
one, one family per table. And so column families are a way to split that default uh, column family up. So, and so, the, so your customer has the flexibility of choosing a column family, like, hey, like basically column ABC is one column family. Yes. Okay. So, yeah. go on. Um, and so uh, for, for an example of why you would want to do this is, uh, let's say you have, um, you know, some columns in the table that are small and frequently updated. Other columns are, uh, are, are large and don't change as much. Putting those larger columns into a, uh, into a separate column family um, can help because then you don't need to touch those, uh, those big blobs unless you need to. It is actually very similar to how we model things on Cassandra, right? So the ones that are basically very frequently accessed, you may want to put it together to mm -hmm. improve your reads and updates and that. Okay. With respect to Pebble, I have an interesting question uh, that, that 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 I always wondered. Like uh, RocksDB was based on LSM, uh, okay. so is basically Pebble. Uh, now uh, LSM is typically like R. Like is your LSM implementation suited for modern hardware? For example, you would be running your database on top of SSDs. So. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, are your reads and writes uh, suitable for modern hardware? For example, I was looking to, uh, I, I was, I was going through a few papers and I found an implementation called TreeLine. So what TreeLine does, uh, it's a, so the paper starts with a very interesting premise and it states that uh, LSMs were built long back. Uh, they are built for HDDs, uh, but because SSDs are really awesome at in-place updates, what if we reimagine the same paradigm and they built their own structure around it called tree line. So while I was going through that paper, uh, I wondered what, what changes would happen at rocks TV level. And now in transition, uh, if, if, if I want to extend this question to Pebble, I, I want to know, like if you do some hardware specific optimization in your paper, now that you have the code base, you have re-implemented it. Is there something which is specific to the kind of hardware you run in? Uh, which makes it slightly more performant in certain cases, of course, uh, for your system, or uh, is it a crude LSM implementation by just, and plus basically without all the fluff that surrounds? Um, I'm not familiar with the paper you, uh, paper you mentioned, and uh, this storage level technology is not, uh, is not my area of expertise. Um, hmm. So I'm not, uh, so, any, sure so, any, so it's, it's okay if you're not familiar with paper. I'm yeah. just saying that, that, that concept where now what people are doing is people are reimagining because a lot of great <laughs> work in database happened in, let's say early nineties. Yeah. Right? And at that time, the hardware requirements were something like we were, we were restrained with basically magnetic disk storage at what talking. Now SSD and SSDs came in and now really highly efficient SSDs came. So I, I, my, my question is simple. Like mm -hmm. do you folks do any hardware level optimization uh, when it comes to storage, leveraging the kind of hardware that you have in case, in case. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, we, we don't do, uh, we don't do any hardware specific uh, kinds of, uh, kinds of optimizations. I mean, we do, uh, we do, I mean, everyone's running on SSDs today um, mm -hmm. and uh but you know they're running through uh, a variety of different virtualization layers. So you've got cloud storage like EBS and uh, or, or uh, you know VMware and uh, and vSAN and uh, and things like that. Um, so uh, we we, are, we uh, in general we're focused on uh, on running uh, running everywhere. Um, we're, we're not uh, not ready to uh, to pick particular you know kinds of hardware to uh, to optimize for. I think the uh, the hard drive versus SSD question is interesting. Uh, it's true that uh, LSMs were uh, were developed in the days of hard drives, and they were very much tuned for the uh, for the uh, the properties of hard drives, and that they uh, they minimize uh, seeking and and things like that. Um, but at the same time, um, that, you know, the, people have been using uh, LSMs on SSDs um, for years now as well, and uh, and they work well in that environment. Um, and uh, I don't, uh, I don't see anyone going from uh, LSMs back to B trees on uh, on SSDs or anything like that. Maybe there's some new kind of uh, new kind of tree uh, that uh, that would be good for for uh, SSDs, uh, or maybe there's other ways to think about uh, write ahead logging and things like that. Because if you look at the way SSDs work, they often have a kind of internal uh, write ahead log um, that, uh, and, and so there's uh, there's uh, some concern about uh, you know there's just Write ahead logs at every level of the system these days that are kind of doing redundant work. Yeah. So that was actually that was the premise of the entire paper. Like they just 
said that because in place updates are not as expensive as they were with magnetic mm-hmm. disk storage what if we reimagine and that just got yeah. me thinking like 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 we should be changing that one aspect can we do something about it so basically that's where my uh, my actually question actually stemmed out from okay yeah. so yeah. Uh, uh next uh, thing uh, like whenever i spoke basically whenever i speak to anyone about cockroach like hey a database like this exists the first thing that i hear is hey, is it isn't that similar to spanner and i know you would have gotten this question far too many times like <laughs> i would go slightly more specific into that like spanner like what made spanner special was its true time algorithm right now uh, and true time was running on specific set of hardware with a specific set of technology meant purely for google now when you are heavily inspired from spanner now given your implementation you obviously did not have that leeway to use true time so what was that one interesting challenge like although that acts as an inspiration so a lot of things you would try to see if we can do it on a general purpose hardware so what was that what was like what did you find an alternate to true time or did you kind of read it true time with let's say vector clocks or let's say hybrid logical time stamp or something like that or what was the thought process like when you were being so heavily inspired from spanner um sure so uh true time is uh is definitely one of the things that sticks out in people's mind when they uh when they read about spanner um it's one of the more uh, more distinctive characteristics of it um it's uh i would say it's uh it's a smaller part of the uh, of the spanner design than uh than uh, than a lot of people think um you, you know just like uh just like we've done um most of the uh most of the core uh algorithms for replication and uh and uh transactions um only have a little bit of uh of connection to the to the actual time and so um but we did have to we did have to make a make a couple of changes this is because what uh what true time gives you is uh, is very good clock synchronization i believe google claims that uh, it keeps clock synchronized within 7 milliseconds at all times um and uh you know out uh, outside of google we have to deal with uh, kind of commodity clock synchronization uh using algorithms like ntp or if you're lucky ptp um you, you know we're getting uh, clocks that are synchronized um you know still uh still less than 10 milliseconds most of the time but that can spike up to uh you know 100 milliseconds or more um and so we have to be able to account for that and um because spanner had a uh had a very good uh, upper bound on clock offsets um they have this uh, 7 millisecond upper bound they actually were able to uh to take advantage of this in their transaction protocol by they essentially put a 7 millisecond sleep at the end of any transaction um and so they just wait for uh, wait for clock uncertainty to pass uh, now for us we have to deal with clock uncertainties that may be up to uh, up to 100 milliseconds and we don't want to put 100 milliseconds sleep everywhere and so what we do is we try to detect cases where clocks may be out of sync and when uh when we detect that then uh the then the transactions uh we actually detect it on reads rather than on writes and when we detect uh clock uh, uh potential clock issues then some reads may have to wait or in some cases may get an error and have to start over and retry um so we have a uh so so we we make some some re- we make some reads rate wait while uh, spanner makes all all writes wait for the uh for the clock uncertainty to pass so your end user still remains unaffected they might see slight elevated response time but uh they are but but it is basically transparent from them so they have no idea what's happening like the like the retries are all internal uh unfortunately the retries are not all internal sometimes this does result in an error coming back to the back to the client and you have to you have to retry oh okay so then your so then the users of cockroach db needs to be aware of but in but in any case given that you folks offer strong consistency even if it's a retry it is not leading to data corruption now we see the importance of uh, offering that so yeah. okay. so i was uh, while while i was going through this i found this uh, uh, hybrid logical uh, clock that you folks have implemented Mm-hmm. then uh, and, and and i believe that that powers your ability to do time travel on data uh, is is that true uh not not exactly um mm-hmm. i think our ability to do time travel queries is really built on our use of uh, mvcc or multi version concurrency control mm-hmm. uh, and we do we do use hybrid logical clocks um here 
but uh, essentially th there, there wouldn't be much change if we were using um, if we were using uh, just plain wall clocks um, or uh, or vector clocks. Ve so, vector clocks would complicate so then, things. So but, then, with respect to time travel, uh, yeah. the way you folks have, like again, uh, basically, let me start with a with a slightly basic question on that, like. Do people really use this time travel feature? Because it looks really interesting that, hey, you would get all the versions of the data that you have. Uh, and, and again, you can configure a deletion policy and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But still, uh, do do people really need this? Like any any specific real world example that you can talk about where your, where your customers are actually using? Because I, I always found it there are so many databases who would offer so much of such stuff. But I always wonder, uh, when my data is updated, it's updated. Do I need to go mm -hmm. back? Uh, and like at the database level, I can choose to re-implement it at the application level, mm -hmm. but at the database level, do I need that uh, particular thing at a row level or, or, or at a document level per se? Uh, yeah, so our time travel queries, so this is our feature where you can say, add to a select statement, uh, select as of system time, and then give it a, give it a timestamp. Um, this actually powers uh, several uh, interesting capabilities in CockroachDB. Um, so on the surface, it's used as a uh, as a neat demo trick. So you can say, okay, I'm going to change this table and then go uh, go select uh, go, go select some data out of the past. So it's a, it's a fun trick. And then uh, you, you know somebody comes along and accidentally deletes some data, and then uh, and then they're able to use a time travel query to get it back. So that's that's one level of of usefulness for uh, uh, for time travel queries. But also um, it uh, it can interact with the uh, with the transaction system in uh, in interesting ways. So uh, I just mentioned that in the event of uh, clock uncertainty, um, you may get uh, you may get an error uh, coming back to the uh, coming back to the client, and you have to retry the query. Uh, if you're running that query um, a little bit in the past as a time travel query, that doesn't happen. And so that's uh, if you don't need the uh, the latest data, you can run uh, run your queries uh, time travel a second in the past. And uh, and they can be uh, more uh, more reliable. They can also be faster um, because uh, if you're reading from the past, then we can read from your local replica instead of uh, instead of from the from the leaseholder for that uh, for that range. Yeah, because that's that's a that's a that's a pretty cool advantage that you get. Um, mm -hmm. So what what does it take you to implement it at a storage level? Like then for every value that is updated, is it a, like it has to be a new entry? In your uh, uh, basically in your table instance, which is running locally, uh, for that, uh, like, what does your key look like then? So then the key is also, let's say, is it also prefixed with time or something? It's it's suffixed with time, yes. So suffixed. every mm -hmm. yeah, so every uh, every key at the Pebble level, each uh, each key is going to start with a table ID and then the indexed value, and then it ends with a timestamp. And that's our table. So and. Because it is ordered, uh, you are still able to do a very quick lookup for if you're if you're going through it because it is ordered. Your reads are mm -hmm. still fast, uh, but then yeah. it, pretty awesome advantage. Uh, one one question I had on this is uh, uh, you spoke about like uh, you spoke about uh, uh, multiple replicas. Basically, you call it Jabo replica sets that you have for uh, the ranges of data. Right, mm -hmm. uh, one of them is a leader. While other yeah. two are followers, uh, your reads can still go to follower uh, in case you want inconsistency. Uh, yeah. Like if, if if you're okay with eventual consistency, but yeah. if you want strong consistency, it would always go to the leader replica uh, of that. Now with this, uh, what is a replication? Like I was going through it. Like you folks do uh, uh, synchronous writes at multiple places. Like mm -hmm. let's say if you have a replica set of three, you do writes at three places. You wait for two and then you move on. Like basically, yeah. once you have the quorum, you move on. Now, what if the write to the third node fails? Is there an asynchronous replication that is happening where yes. the third one actually catches up? Uh, yes. Yeah. So all of the, all of the writes that come into the system uh, in, enter through uh, enter through the the leader node for that uh, for that uh, range of data, mm -hmm. and uh, and then the leader will write uh, in parallel. It'll copy that data out to the two followers. Um, and as you said, as soon as uh, as soon as it gets a majority, then it it returns back to the client, and it's considered committed. Um, but that leader is going to keep going. It's going to uh, keep uh, it's going to keep pinging the uh, pinging all of the followers, making sure that they're up to date. Um, the followers will respond with uh, with the last log index that they're aware of. And so, if it, if the leader sees that the that one follower's log is behind, it will uh, it'll be able to catch it up. 
that's not my next question was like if if like is it is it leader who is ensuring that the that the followers are following correctly or is it responsibility of the followers to see that hey i am basically lagging behind uh, it's it? basically pushed from the leaders instead of pulled by the followers why because most of them implemented with pull based stuff why a push based model here um uh that's uh that's basically because that's how that's how uh, the raft protocol is defined that's the uh distributed consensus algorithm that we use for our replication but if but if let's say if i were to not use raft for example mm -hmm. then uh, any any good reasons that you found that that made you go like like assume raft is not in the picture yeah. would you still go with push based or a pull based well so push based for for the common case when you're not catching up after a failure uh push based mm -hmm. is more natural so you've got the request coming in at the at the at the leader. Uh, it's going to be faster for the leader to push that out to the followers than for the followers to be pulling uh, pulling updates from from the leader. But then um, this this might also overwhelm the follower. And in case of a general purpose hardware, if, if the follower is not responding or if it died off, then the leader is always looking up. Hey, where's my third replica? For example, when a new machine comes up, then 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 it looks like an additional work on leader. Uh, when you go with push based mm -hmm. what what uh, what's the rationale behind um well for for one thing um in our system because we divide the data up into uh relatively small ranges um so there are many leaders and many followers and so each each node in the system is going to have a lot of ranges and for some of those leaders it's going to be a leader and some of those ranges it's going to be a follower and so um because every node is both a both a leader for some ranges and a follower for others at the same time, it, it all kinds of ba kind of balances out. Right. Um, so um, that, you know, pushing uh, but pushing responsibility from the from the leader side to the follower side is uh, is not necessarily uh, beneficial for us. That's right. This is uh, because every node is leader for some range and follower for some other range. So it eventually, it balances out for that. Okay. So uh, you 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 mentioned draft. Let's go into your 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 favorite topic, <laughs> consensus. Right? Well, uh, basically, whenever I was reading about you, it is always like wrote the core consensus part or every time, mm -hmm. every single time, right? So I I want to know about this that you chose Raft, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, why Raft over Paxos? Like everybody talks about Paxos. Okay, Raft is mm -hmm. a brilliant algorithm, and I love it. Mm -hmm. But uh, I also see the challenges that come with it. While Paxos mm -hmm. seems relatively simpler to you. Now, what's 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 your take on Raft versus Paxos? Before we go slightly deeper into Raft side of things, <laughs> what why? Yeah, sure. So, uh, so when we were starting CockroachDB in 2014, uh, the Raft protocol was relatively new, um, and uh, and it was designed to be much simpler than Paxos, which uh, which is uh, notoriously complex, um, actually. So, um, the, you know the 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 original Paxos paper was published uh, in, was it 1990, I think, um, some, a long time ago. Um, but it wasn't really implemented at any significant scale until after uh, after 2000, um, when uh, after the uh, the author had published a second paper called Paxos Made Simple that uh, really explained the uh, explained the algorithm better. Um, and so, uh, so so Paxos was uh, was notoriously complex. Um, Raft was the was the new one on the block. Um, you know, you were talking earlier about using about looking at Pebble to kind of expand your Go skills. Um, uh, for me, uh, Raft uh, was, and for, for a lot of people actually, there were a bunch of Raft implementations written in Go. Uh, there were a lot of people who wanted to use uh, use Raft as a, as an excuse to to practice their uh, practice their Go, and that was uh, that was true of me as well. Um, so my first uh, my, my first Raft implementation, which has uh, thankfully been uh, been thrown away, was also a, a chance to learn a lot about Go. Um, but anyway. Um, so Raft was uh, Raft was uh, known for simplicity in comparison to Paxos, and so we chose it because we thought we, we knew that we were going to be an unusual user of uh, of a consensus algorithm because we're going to run uh, many uh, many instances of it at once um, because this is how we get uh, some nodes being leaders for some ranges and and followers for another, and so we knew that we uh, that we were going to be able, going to need to customize whatever uh, whatever consensus algorithm we were using. And so we uh, we thought that Raft's uh, simplicity would uh, would allow us to do that, uh, and that's uh, that's why we chose it. 
you change it today? Years, would you still uh, change it? Like, would you still keep Raft or would you switch to Paxos? Uh, switching to Paxos is a uh, is a gigantic uh, project that I don't even want to think about. No, but uh, hypothetically, but if I were, hypothetically, yeah, hypothetically, hypothetically, if I were, if I were starting from scratch today, I would uh, I would go with uh, go with Paxos instead, um, because the reason that Raft appears to be simple is that it has uh, it has fewer concepts. It uh, it combines a lot of uh, a lot of the different moving parts that you get in a Paxos implementation into uh, into one thing, and uh, and that makes it uh, simpler to learn, but it makes it a lot harder to modify. Um, we found uh, a number of places over the years where um, we would like to be able to change some small part of uh, of Raft, but we can't because it's kind of tied together with this other thing. Uh, whereas Paxos, on the other hand, is a little more modular. Um, Paxos itself is very uh, is very small, but uh, you know it's not it's not usable on its own. You need to extend it uh, usually with uh, something called multi Paxos. Um, but there are a lot of different variations. There's uh, fast Paxos and flexible Paxos and wide Paxos and you know all these things. You can kind of pick and choose different uh, different pieces to uh, to put together. And so that that turns out to be the kind of uh, the kind of flexibility that we need, um, not the uh, the, the uh, apparent simplicity of uh, of Raft. So in 2014, uh, while, while I was doing my master's, uh, we I took a subject on distributed systems, and one of the assignment was to implement Paxos. <laughs> um, our actually our our professor tried to explain Paxos. No one of us understood it. <laughs> it was there in assignment. We found a few implementations, and at the time, SourceForge or something was quite famous. We found one implementation, and we just ran it. We still did not understand how it ran, yeah. but we somehow. Somehow, just submitted the assignment. Uh, three years later, uh, while I was exploring uh, slightly more detailed around uh, distributed databases in general, I again stumbled upon it because I, at that time, I thought it is just a simple theoretical concept. It is okay for me to to skip. Mm -hmm. Then, when I started diving into real systems and especially databases, I kept on stumbling across Paxos. And then the raft emergence came uh, from basically 2015, 2016. Suddenly. I could see on Hacker News everybody rewriting Raft. For some weird reason, every week one blog post on Raft was mm -hmm. getting trending. So I'm like, let me go into Raft. And yeah. then I try to implement Raft, then uh, data makes simple or some that a particular website is there that has a very mm -hmm. nice Raft a visualization that helped me understand. But then still, with respect to Paxos, I still try to understand that code. I still try to implement, but <laughs> it was getting really difficult. Then I started taking distributed consensus as a black box. Let hey, us just rely on that. But again, mm -hmm. Raft was easier to understand. I, right. I I totally agree with that. But uh, I don't know. I'm still unable to wrap my head around Paxos. But over time, I know it, it would happen. Like once I get my hands dirty, would be. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I tried to run away from it. And every time I was going into something real world, and I always stumbled upon this. Always, yes. always. Oh, yeah. But uh, good to hear uh, how you ended up using Raft and you still go for Paxos today. Uh, interesting. Uh, so, uh, uh, with respect to CockroachDB as an offering, uh, if you folks have a very nice cloud offering where everything is managed for you, you just go three clicks, you spin up your cluster, start putting your data, start querying it. Right? Now, in such cases, especially when you have a serverless offering, one thing that makes it really interesting is how do you handle multi-tenancy at scale, especially with respect to databases. Right? So mm -hmm. uh, just to give you some context, I uh, was part of Google. I worked for a team called Dataproc. Uh, we do basically managed Hadoop. Now I left Google to build my startup, but uh, basically kind of basically very similar to your trajectory. Uh, so while we were doing it, I could see the pain that it came when we offered Dataproc as a serverless offering. In right? multi-tenancy was a big pain. Now, with spe and it is even bigger when, when it comes to databases because people just take databases for granted and they put load, they read stuff and whatnot. And handling multi-tenancy for something as critical as database is quite a challenge. So just mm -hmm. wanted to pick your brains on around how do you ensure, like how do you do, like how do you implement multi-tenancy for a serverless offering of Um, Sure. So. Um... Like I, like I mentioned earlier, uh, SQL is uh, is a very difficult uh, thing to generalize about because there's so much variation in what uh, in what different queries can do, uh, and that's what makes it that makes it hard to offer um, 
a multi tenant not multi tenancy in a uh in a in a monolithic database you know i remember the days of the uh you know back in the 90s when you'd get a you know a cheap web hosting service that would give you uh give you an account on a shared mysql instance um and it was just kind of the wild west there was no uh no real isolation between uh between different applications um and so um yeah you know so so in uh, in cockroach db uh serverless um i would say we we have uh, essentially a three tier um architecture so there's kind of a uh a SQL uh, front end proxy that all the uh, incoming connections come to. Uh, and then on the back end, there is a, a shared uh, key value store. So we take the key value layer of, of CockroachDB and run it as, as a shared service. And then in between, we have the SQL layer. And the SQL layer is, uh, is, all, uh, is all single tenant. We will spin up a new SQL pod for each, uh, for, for each, uh, each customer um, in, the, in the serverless system. And so that uh, that's really the the key to providing good uh, good, good isolation between users because it's a SQL layer where all of the uh, all of the uh, complexity and unpredictability comes in. I mean, you can think of it that uh, SQL uh, uh, the SQL layer of a, of a database is really taking arbitrary code from uh, from the user and and running it. Um, you, you know, it's in a, it's it's not taking like an arbitrary binary, but uh, you know, it's still it's still code is being run through an interpreter or uh, potentially run through a, a just in time compiler or something like that. Um, and so, you know, we give each uh, each user it their own uh, private SQL pod or uh, or multiple pods, um, and then that uh, that that can talk down to the shared uh, the shared key value uh, layer. But because the key value interface is so much uh, is so much simpler, um, we can be uh, oh, the performance is much more predictable, and we can uh, we can provide uh, better isolation between uh, between tenants at that layer, even though it's in a shared part of the system. So you basically segregated storage and computer, where your storage yeah. is shared um, while your computer is segregated. Uh, approximately, yeah. Appro so yeah, yeah approximately, yeah, approximately. It's a it's yeah. an approximation. Yeah. So with with this kind of stuff, where like. Where do you actually ration the request? Like every user would have some sort of throughput that that they can hit their system with. So mm -hmm. at the at the front end SQL proxy layer you have versus the SQL execution layer and the storage. Where does the rationing take place? Like is your storage is where the rationing takes place, or the SQL layer, or at a front end? Um, yeah, I think. Uh... Mainly, it happens in the uh, in the SQL layer because this is uh, this is where most of the uh, of the per tenant uh, per tenant logic is, um, and so um, we have we have this uh, we have this notion of uh, of request units as kind of our our billable unit, uh, where one uh, one request unit is uh, essentially the the cost of doing one uh, a single row lookup by primary key, um, and then everything else is kind of uh, charged proportional to that in terms of its uh, overall CPU. Uh, CPU and network usage, um, and so we uh, so, so um, the SQL pods are responsible for uh, keeping track of uh, of how many uh, how many units uh, the customers are using, and then to uh, kind of rate limit themselves in in interacting with the uh, with the uh, with the back end, and then the back end uh, also does some uh, some also, some rate limiting of its own for uh, for ensuring that, uh, that there's some level of uh, fair sharing going on between the different uh, between the different tenants. So then there is still a risk of your storage layer throttling because of any abusive users. Uh, is, is, is that a problem? Um, it, uh, it's certainly a theoretical problem. I don't know. Um, mm. I, I don't know how, uh, how much of a problem it is in, in practice. Um, and as I said, this, the simplicity of the, of the KV API, um, does, uh, d does let us, uh, do some, uh, do some pretty decent things to, uh, to, to uh, you know, have have per tenant queues and uh, and not have uh, not, not let one uh, one tenant dominate the uh, dominate the server. Can we assume that your storage layer is more like a distributed key value? Like basically, uh, a, a a nice analogy could be a, a basically a pond full of basically pebbles, which is like a distributed file system filled with a lot of pebble instances. Is <laughs> is is that your storage layer? Um. Like for example, yeah, if I, mean, if I like 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 if like if if I were to rephrase the question, uh, how does your request from your customer using the Postgres mm -hmm. client yeah. reach to their storage and it comes back? Like what's what's the flow there? Uh, yeah, so we have uh, the system is divided into uh, into several layers. So starting with uh, with SQL at the top, 
Um, I mean, SQL can be can be subdivided into different layers, like there's uh, yeah. parsing, <laughs> parsing and planning and uh, and execution. Mm -hmm. uh, but then at the KV layer, um, the KV layer is actually architected as uh, four uh, four KV layers on top of each other with uh, almost the same interface all the way down. And so we have uh, the K the entry point to the KV system is the transaction layer. And below that, you have the distribution layer, and then the replication layer, and then the storage layer. Um, but all of these, uh, uh, the layers below the uh, below the transaction layer, all have the same uh, interface. Actually, you could, uh, at least in theory, I don't know if I don't know if this would actually compile today. You could uh, you could stub out the uh, distribution and replication layers, connect the transaction layer directly to Pebble, and get a kind of uh, a kind of cockroach DB light uh, that would run in a in a more uh, a more self contained way. I'm definitely going to try this because uh, <laughs> I, I I actually got it set up. Uh, I I like like few like I, and again I don't remember when it was about uh, four or five months back. I was uh, skimming through your code base and I saw variable name which was like seventy two characters long. <laughs> and 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 I and I and I actually tweeted about it, <laughs> saying look how look how descriptive the variable <laughs> name is. It was sixty two or seventy two characters long. Almost, almost, it took the entire mm -hmm. width of my editor. <laughs> it and and it was a boolean variable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh God. So I, I I have this tendency to uh, just get a basically database set up locally and play around with the source code, add some debugging points to see what's happening behind the scenes, and just try to make sense. And I again understand the overall complexity of it, but it's still fun to just go through a few bits and pieces of it. Uh, some of the comments uh, in your code base uh, around uh, around I think transactions were superb. Like it just mm -hmm. gave like it was again it was not part of your blog post or your official documentation. Mm -hmm. But in that code snippet, those were like some really interesting design decisions you folks made. Yeah. And uh, I wrote like a 10-15 part series on uh, basically Twitter and LinkedIn. Uh, talking mm -hmm. about uh, some interesting aspects of Cockroach DB about like, eight or nine months back. So yeah. through that, I actually recorded, which is why I was so excited to have this conversation with you because I never imagined. I was just exploring it for fun. I started with to better my Go skills, and now that I got some time about eight months back, I went slightly deeper. Today I'm having this conversation. So thanks again yeah. for doing this. Uh, just to touch upon one interesting part that. Uh, like I'm a huge fan of databases and I love to explore the domain. I read VLDB papers for fun. Uh, that's my, that's my, that's my favorite pastime. I have my desk filled with paper printouts. Uh, and more importantly, I just, uh, um, with respect to like the latest two editions of VLDB, they also attach the source code. So tree line again, I set it up locally, uh, figure out how they are doing and whatnot. I do a lot of those stuff. So given that the world of databases is hot again, at least from my sample space, because from my sample, even I'm reading about that a lot, I see DuckDB coming up, uh, basically TersoDB doing a fab work. Now, Astro Framework integrated TersoDB with LibSQL and all, they are doing it. The world of databases is hot again. Which database are you most excited about? Like, apart from Cockroach, obviously, mm -hmm. which database are you most excited about? Um, so I think I'll answer in terms of like database technology instead of a specific, uh, yeah, yeah. database yeah. but uh, I, I think that uh, I think that stored procedures are really due for a comeback mm. uh, I think that uh, the reason that stored procedures uh, fell out of fashion uh, years ago was that uh, the database was really hard to scale and so you needed to move as much stuff out of the database as you uh, as you could um, just for for scalability reasons and so now that uh, now that we have databases like CockroachDB that uh, show that you can scale the execution in a distributed way in the database um, you can um, you know, you can imagine a world in which uh, you, you move a lot more of your execution into the database itself, and uh, and use that as your uh, as your distributed execution engine. Um, you know, if you squint, it can look a little bit like but uh, like a kind of a, a lambda function as a service uh, environment, um, all in the uh, all in the database. Um, I so like I think uh, it, I like how to put it that uh, stored procedures are due for a for a revamp. It is they are they are like. I, I remember using like my first job in 2012 when I was doing, uh, we leveraged like our entire business logic were in stored procedures. We never wrote uh, application logic, pay, uh, we never wrote SQL query using ORMs and all. Everything was baked in. So we used to have a file 
they used to call it finder framework something i don't know if it is was open source or something but my, my but the company that i worked for it was a small company but they did again over engineering uh we used to and i suddenly recall it i have received thanks for that i i suddenly recall that we used to call it finder framework and there were humongous text files filled with business mm-hmm. logic and uh we used to run a script finder dot something and it used to load all of them in databases yeah and our entire web layer was abstracted we used to literally map endpoint to a stored procedure that's yeah. it and uh and again i could see the pain points that every time we had to change something we had to mm-hmm. uh, reinjust the stored or rather recreate or update the stored procedures for that and which is why it typically went out of fashion yeah but uh, given that we are on the topic what do you think can someone innovate in this space uh, with respect to stored process given that you are mm-hmm. putting kind of your business logic in stored processes and putting it on the database like what do you think can be done there Yeah so I think the other thing uh you know like like you say you know you had all these uh you, you know scripts to load giant text files into yeah. the into the database I think the uh the, the second reason aside from the scalability of the database that uh, stored procedures fell out of fashion was just that the developer experience was not very good mm-hmm. uh version control was not good um th- things like that it didn't uh you know it just didn't fit it just doesn't fit into the uh the development workflows that uh, that people have and uh today even even less so So I think there's a lot of room to innovate on the uh on the uh on the the developer experience side of uh, of stored procedures and so you you know what if uh you know what if you uh compile uh c- compile whatever your source language is to web assembly and uh and st- ship that into the database or what if you use uh mvcc in the database as a kind of version control system for your code um use that to do uh you know blue green deployments and things like that in the in the database layer i think uh getting ideas i think there's a lot of uh <laughs> i'm getting yeah, ideas <laughs> there's a lot a lot of a lot of things you can do you, you know don't don't go back to don't go back to stored procedures the the way they were in the past yeah, but just yeah. take that take that idea that, you know use the distributed distributed execution components of your distributed database and uh, mm. and build on that what does that what does that look like for the future i think there's a lot of potential there so given your background you were thinking from on that side and given my background i am thinking on the application side that what <laughs> if i encode like somehow i come up with a framework like a flask or a django Uh, mm-hmm. in which when i'm writing the business logic i write it in a normal language format but then mm-hmm. convert it into stored procedure somehow yep and what if i ingest it so again for a developer like when you spoke about developer experience for developer it's like a uh, it's like a regular business logic mm-hmm. but a transpiler which actually transpiles it into a stored procedure and updates yep. it so you get best of both worlds but again <laughs> it's a pretty interesting concept i'm not sure if someone has already done it but I am getting ideas to you. <laughs> thanks, thanks for that match. That's that's really interesting. Stored procedures as like they are due. They are long time due. I I last used it 2018. It has been six years. We we are building a gamification engine, and the reason we used it was uh, uh, we had to fire a lot of queries and uh, doing it at the application level just uh, just ate up all the throughput. Our database was getting messier, so we. put all of that in stored procedure uh saved some infrastructure cost like we we did not have to scale up our database while our application logic was easy and the business logic was also not changing we knew that it was going to sustain so last in 6 years ago i used uh, stored mm-hmm. procedures yeah no. <laughs> nice so stored procedures again point taken very interesting mm-hmm. thing that someone can innovate on that uh so super and again um one of the first uh blogs that you folks had uh and again uh it was also part of you giving a talk on in a couple of conferences the way you put it is uh like how uh cdns to compute near the users what if database becomes the cdn like like we take mm-hmm. database closer to the user and i love that analogy i love that that what if there is a database which is always almost on the edge where you mm-hmm. where your users live and uh, it gave rise to this really nice implementation of distributed sql and that was a really interesting analogy that i saw that it just sparked so many ideas so many ideas that just with this one insight you can reimagine an entire database which again is now a uh, uh, java cockroach db 
but again, when I now see, uh, let's say, basically Tarso DB kicking in, which are trying to do something similar with SQLite on the almost on the edge. Basically, Firebase uh, did basically Firestore try to did that uh, try to do that uh, with that part, and I see this as a massive potential for database because a lot of compute now, like again, it's all possible combinations that you may think exist would exist at a certain yeah. point in time. The storage getting closer to the user, which you folks spoke about in 2016, 2017 ish time. I see that basically coming it all together with especially DuckDB doing analytics on a single node on machine, which most people need. And that was superbly done. So I see that, but I, I just wanted to, uh, uh, I just wanted to appreciate like how that one line made it so easy for us to understand the importance of taking database closer to the user, right? So on that note, uh, given how prominent distributed SQL is going to be, like, do you think it will become a norm in next 10 years? Like having databases live on the edge uh, with respect to CockroachDB, for example, where your database is closer to your user and you take care of the complexities of, of like all the dirty work, ensuring consistency, isolation, whatnot, right? On, on your side. Do you think distributed SQL will, will become a norm? Um, I think uh, I think distributed SQL in uh, in some form is going to uh, going to become a lot more uh, a lot more mm -hmm. common. Um, there's a, there's an awful lot of inertia in the database space. Um, you, you know, once someone uh, once someone adopts a database, they're uh, they they usually stick with it for decades. Mm -hmm. So you know, people don't people don't like to move from from one database to another. So is it going to become you know ubiquitous? Uh, you, you know, that's going to be a you know many years long uh, journey to get there. Um, I do think it's uh, you know it can reach the point over the next uh, over the next five or ten years that it becomes uh, very common to start new new projects in a in a distributed database. Um, and for the the database on the edge scenario that you're talking about, that uh, that needs some other things to come along to make it uh, make it more feasible. Um, I think that uh, what we found um, in the years since I gave that talk. Um, is that a lot of people aren't quite ready to run their own applications on the edge, you know, let alone their database. So, um, you know, I think we need, uh, you know, we need more more norms around just running uh, your application on the edge before uh, before a database on the edge can uh, can become the even, norm. Even now that I'm building my setup, I'm not keen. <laughs> yeah, I, I still want that traditional stuff that let it be on my server, let user make call, I'd add a caching layer, a simple proven solution. Again, it, it it requires a lot of reimagination uh, when 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 you are taking something as weird, like as not weird, but as as new and as unconventional. Like how you adopt a draft as a challenge, like hey, it's new, it's exciting, let me try it out, and then it became this. I'm I'm still wrapping my head. Uh, a lot of my friends do put their business logic on the edge. I don't know how they do it. I'm like, why? Uh, I I like my first reaction to any new thing is no. I don't want that, mm -hmm. right? like because I don't like changes often, and uh, that's what makes me quite restrained for this kind of stuff. But now, when I see something becoming quite popular, then I go and try that out. And uh, but I well said that point that people still need to have their business logic first move to compute before the storage goes there. But, uh, so you led like Cockroach Chip is open source. I, I I tried like and. To be honest, a lot of people push stuff on GitHub. Uh, they plan to start their open source project. I did my own database called DiceDB. So I re-implemented Redis and Golang. So that was my hobby project. So I wanted to know how Redis worked. So mm -hmm. I went through the source code. It was written in C. I'm like, what better to do to understand it to then to re-implement, uh, then to re-implement. But I thought that if I would do it in C, I would be tempted to copy paste. <laughs> so that's mm -hmm. why I chose, let me do it in Go. So I've been coding in Go since 2015. I love the programming language. So um, I re-implemented Redis in Golang. Now, what happened was, uh, I said that, hey, this would be the next big thing in open source, for example. Uh, and uh, I pushed it on GitHub. It has 500 stars, got traction. But one thing I realized that building something versus driving a community to make those changes is incredibly different. So, mm -hmm. uh, how did you lead massive open source project? Like what's the secret sauce? Because the community needs to be there. You need to constantly having an eye on top of the, the pull request, the issues that are coming in. Plus, uh, in most cases, people with a very, very 
high motivation come in within a day or two when the code base is when they understand that mm-hmm. that it's way too difficult for them they drop off right and then a lot of complications come in that to keep the momentum going how do you do this like i i, I just want to learn from your experience on uh, managing a massive open source project like cockroach um i don't know i'm not sure that we uh, are a are a great example of a of an open source community project um, because um, we were we were a community based project for the first year. Cockroach TV mm-hmm. was an open source project before it was mm-hmm. a company, mm-hmm. and we got a lot of uh, got got a lot of interest in that uh, in that mm-hmm. first year. Um, we came in with a uh, a design doc that was pretty uh, pretty well fleshed out, um, a name that got a lot of attention. Um, it always got voted up on uh, on Hacker News, um, even though all the comments were people uh, saying how much they hated the name. Um, so we we got a lot of attention. We got a lot of uh, a fair number of contributions early on. Um, but uh, but once we got to the point of uh, of commercializing it and building a company around it, um, you know the center of gravity immediately was on the on the side of the company. You know we have um, you know from very early on we had a handful of people contributing to the code base full time. No one on the in the outside community was uh, was doing that much uh, was doing that much work on it. So it quickly be, took on the character of a, of a corporate project rather than a, a community community driven one. But and so we still, still have, but we still have the source code out there. Yeah, I, yes, and we still have we, we still have uh, outside contributions coming in, but uh, it's really uh, a small amount in comparison to the the, the work that's going on um, inside the inside the company. So, is it fair to say that if you try to commercialize this kind of stuff, it becomes difficult for like again, people would be hesitant that hey, why am I contributing to this if these guys are anyway going to make money out of it? Is 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 that a kind of psychology that basically kicks it that you see uh, fewer contributions? I, I think that's I think that's a part of it. I think people are not as uh, not not as motivated to contribute to some uh, some other company's uh, success. But I think it's uh, I, th- I think it's more just just a sheer volume game. You, you know, once uh, once we have uh, you know dozens of engineers working on the code base, then it's uh, you know it's constantly moving and evolving, and uh, it, you know it's it's hard for someone on a hobbyist basis uh, to keep up. I mean, I see that uh, I see that myself. Um, just as I've uh, you know, as the company's uh, grown and the founders have uh, have stepped away from uh, from coding, I still get in uh, you know every few months to do some work on the code, and I'm you know it's like every time I come in, it's like everyone's rearranged the furniture. Like I don't know where things are. Um, so just keeping up with uh, keep, keeping up with uh, with a fast moving code base is uh, is uh, is challenging if you're uh, if you're just doing it on a hobby level. Then why still open source? Why don't just basically take it off the shelf? Um, I think it uh, yeah yeah you know like we we all uh, we, we all came up through the open source community. Uh, my co-founders uh, you know created uh, created the GIMP uh, way back in the nineties. Yeah, yeah, I saw um, that. And uh, you know, I've worked on uh, Tornado and uh, a lot of open source things in the in the Python realm. And uh, you, you know so we really. Uh, we really value open source, um, so we, we like uh, we like giving back to the community that's uh, spawned so much of uh, of what we've uh, what we've worked with uh, throughout our our careers. Um, also, being uh, open source gives us a lot of uh, a lot of credibility. Uh, people like being able to see our code and uh, development processes out in the out in the open, um, and uh, you know I think it also um, you know makes people uh, makes people feel good to have the uh, have the uh, the option to you know take take the code base and uh, and work on it themselves whether whether they end up taking that uh, taking that path or not um, you know we get a lot of uh, a lot of value from um, from just having the code uh, the code out there. Whenever I hear that this this thing is proprietary, I run away from that because if, if although I might not do a deep dive on the source code of that thing, but having that cushion. That if I mm-hmm. want to, I can just take a look into it and see what's happening. That just makes me so much more comfortable. Now, mm-hmm. but when you have your code open source, now what, like, do you do you have that license change that prevents other people from offering it as a managed offering? Uh, like, mm-hmm. how do you safeguard yourself against that? Yeah. So we do. Uh, we, we did. Uh, we did change our license uh, back around uh, 2019. Uh, we changed from the Apache license to the uh, business source license. Um, this is a license that was introduced by uh, MariaDB, um, and it's got a, a kind of a fill-in-the-blank uh, portion to it, um, where uh, you can uh, 
put put in some uh, some custom terms, and we say there that you can't use uh, the free edition of CockroachDB to operate a, uh, a commercial database as a service. That has been a big thing. Uh, 2018, 2019 was the time where everybody was like, yeah, yeah this is this is going out of hand. Uh, we need to mm -hmm. safeguard ourselves. Okay, you spoke about you still spend time, like you still would want to contribute to the code, but every time you go there, you see the furniture be moved around. Mm -hmm. And I think I know the answer, but I should still put forth the question, what is the, basically, what is your favorite piece of code in the project? Um, I don't know. I, th I think the, uh, so, so, well, one of the things I'm uh, I'm proudest of is uh, is how little of my own code is still in the product. That, you know, we built this great team that has uh, that has rewritten, um, you know, and rewritten and updated uh, so much of the uh, of the code that Spencer and Peter and I wrote to uh, to start the project, um, which is really uh, really gratifying to see that we've uh, we've assembled a team who can uh, who can outdo us in uh, in so many areas. Folks, you folks who we are a talent magnet. I'm not going to lie. Uh, if I ask people which project you would like, which is your dream, and if someone is a good good engineer, and if I ask him or her, they would always like basically Corpus DB is definitely basically one of top three. So, and, but by the fab job on uh, on ensuring that people know how amazing of an engineering team, the product, the problem statement in itself is is so well defined, and everybody would just want to be part of it. So, superb, superb job on that. One final thing on that part uh, around uh, you have your cloud offering. Again, it's something like we wear our failures as badges. Any major production outage or goof up uh, that you remember? Um, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna go back into the uh, back into the past for this. Um, you know, the the incidents that we see these days are uh, you know things like. Uh, Latency uh, exceeded our SLA for uh, mm. for 20 minutes and things like that. They don't make good stories. Uh, mm. Back uh, back five six years ago, you could get some uh, really entertaining uh, entertaining blow ups. So um, one uh, one story that I uh, remember was uh, probably six years ago. I think um, a customer that uh, I'm not going to not going to name, but they were one of our first uh, first to use a uh, a multi region uh, uh, cluster of CockroachDB. Um, and their their operational practices were a little bit messy, um, and so it turns out that they had uh, two machines crash in one of their data centers, and they didn't notice for two months. Um, and so, um, yeah, you know, once this uh, once this came to light, uh, they came to us. And this was the first uh, first time a customer has actually been excited about a uh, about uh, you know hardware failure because they're like, this is great, this is cockroach doing exactly what we want it to do. We had nodes uh, machines that were dead for two months and we didn't even notice. Um, so, um, so that they were, they were initially, uh, you know, very pleased with the way Cockroach handled the outage. Um, turns out when you dig a little deeper, um, because these two nodes had crashed at the same time, that took out two of the three copies of a, uh, of a particular piece of data. And so that data was, uh, was unavailable. Um, which means among other things, they hadn't taken a complete backup in, uh, in, uh, two months either. So they were, they were less happy about that. And so, um, you know, we have we have to get those uh, those two machines back online so that we can restore the availability of this uh, of this uh, of this data that was uh, tied up on those machines. Um, so they did that. They uh, they rebooted the machines, connected them back to the cluster, and uh, you know, 20 seconds later, they started crashing. Um, and they would just uh, they would just crash in a loop because these machines now had 60 days worth of old transaction logs to catch up on. Um, and uh, you know, we were prepared for nodes to crash. We weren't prepared for them to stay down for 60 days and, uh, and accumulate uh, so, so much stuff to catch up on. So um, that, that was the, the so the first problem was that these uh, these machines were trying to process the entire transaction log at, at once and just running out of memory. So we had to okay slow that down, process it uh, in uh, in smaller batches so that it can uh, can keep uh, keep making progress. Um, but then um, slowing that slowing that down ended up uh, pushing the uh, pushing the extra work back out to the uh, to the other side where the uh, the surviving nodes were pushing uh, pushing the data onto these nodes that were recovering, and so then those nodes started uh, started having problems and uh, and crashing. Um, that was this is when it turned into a real outage because this was affecting um, you know other other data than just uh, than just these two uh, machines that had been dead for uh, for months anyway. 
Um, so we had to do some do some more work to uh, to make sure that that uh, that process was uh, was properly uh, rate limited and memory monitored on uh, on both sides of the connection um, in order to get everything uh, everything restored. Um, but in the end, everything uh, everything was good. We got uh, we got the the cluster fully restored. We've got uh, you know fixed uh, fixed three or four dis distinct bugs in uh, in Cockroach DB. Uh, the customer is happy. They're still with us today. Oh, that's superb. I was going to ask you that if they're still with you, but great to hear that. <laughs> One thing: if, if 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 this scenario happens today, are you are you basically prepared for that? Let let's say a couple of nodes crashing for sixty days. And, and 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 I assume that uh, six years back, these folks were not on your cloud offering, but they were running it sure. on prem. That's why they did not know. Mm -hmm. But if this happens today, uh, what like how are you handling this? Um, I mean, if the exact same thing happens uh, happens again, then uh, you know I would hope that the fixes we put in place the first time, uh, mm -hmm. you know, would uh, would address it. Uh, we we fixed the we fixed the problem at uh, at multiple levels. You know, as I said, we fixed uh, multiple distinct bugs. We fixed uh, we fixed the bugs that allowed the uh, allowed the transaction logs to grow so big in the first place, um, and then we fixed uh, fixed other bugs so that if we did have a, a very large transaction log, it wouldn't crash. Um, so things like that. So we we fixed it uh, fixed it in multiple places. So I certainly hope we wouldn't see the same thing happening again today. Is is there a way, like for example, if let's say the lag has grown to uh, to a massive time span, can we take a dump from one node and basically load it from a snapshot rather than asking it to catch up? Is 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 that what you have in place? Uh, yeah, that's. Uh, that, that, that's one of the one of the fixes. That's, that's, of that's actually always been that's always been in place, but uh, for some reason it wasn't working in this uh, in this instance. Um, but yeah, so we can um, we, we do have mm -hmm. we, we do have ways to snapshot to, 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 not, to do a snapshot yes. instead of uh, instead of streaming the entire transaction log. Yeah. Just one last question from my side is uh, what next for Cockroach TP? I'm so excited to know. Like, given that you also had some views on. Uh, what you are excited about with respect to database technology when we spoke about short procedures. What next for Cockroach DP? What is the next exciting thing that you folks are launching? Um, sure. So I think uh, we have a, a lot of stuff, uh, a lot of stuff in the works. Um, I think the, uh, you know, we're working on some uh, some updates to our uh, cloud platform and uh, in particular, our uh, serverless and multi-tenant offerings. Um, you know, our, the first version of our of Cockroach TV serverless was uh, re really geared at kind of hobbyist uh, developers um, and really small projects. Um, we're looking to bring that uh, bring that serverless multi-tenant architecture to uh, to, to bigger uh, bigger uh, use cases um, with more more demanding uh, security needs. So we're making uh, making constant improvements there. Have some big updates coming uh, coming down the pipe. Um, we have um, uh, some of the topics that we've uh, discussed today. We uh, we are expanding our support for stored procedures. Um, we've uh, we're making uh, read committed isolation uh, generally available. Um, so we're having um, you know some new features going in, but also uh, we're going kind of back to basics. Um, for a long time, we have been uh, working on with the assumption that we need to build out more features in order to win uh, win new customers. Uh, we think we've uh, finally turned the corner where we have uh, enough critical mass that uh, you know our customers are starting to tell us that uh, you know you have enough uh, you have enough uh, enough features. We just want the, the features that you have to be rock solid. And so uh, that's where an awful lot of our time is going right now is uh, is just making everything um, as uh, as robust as uh, as possible um, and making uh, making things robust to more subtle kinds of issues. You, you know, we're not uh, we're not running out of memory and crashing anymore, but you know we don't ha we don't handle uh, weird network partitions as well as we could, and so we're handling uh, better uh, better network uh, handling ne network partitions better. We're handling um, uh, slow disks better, um, th things like that. All these things that can uh, throw a cluster out of whack without uh, without necessarily causing uh, you know a, a, a complete crash of anything. So many interesting things. So many interesting things to look forward to. I'm sure you you would be you would be so so much excited every single day waking up. Key. Let's let's do this. Let's <laughs> let's nail this problem. But uh, it was fab. It was really amazing talking to you. As I said, huge fan of Cockroach DB. Uh, almost like. Since the time I understood, uh, I understood distributed database, your blogs have helped me a lot. And I see you writing, I see one blog post published two days or three days back. Uh, plus, I love the series that uh, on YouTube called Architecture Simplified. That is an amazing, amazing series. So uh, on, on your channel, the way you folks, the you folks show 
that the node is crashing basically without any mm-hmm. failure uh, it is able to handle what not it just made so much sense uh, so it helped me a lot to ramp up uh, with respect to cockroach db and its capability so yeah first of all thank you so much for doing that i have myself gone through pebbles code base to mm-hmm. the extent that i could uh, to understand some of the nuances so it has helped me become a better go programmer for sure so yeah, thank you so much for all the amazing work that you are doing and thank you so much for taking out time it was amazing yeah. talking thanks thanks so much for having me this has been yeah. it's been a great uh, great conversation Thanks.